on much faster than that. Faster than that is apparently good at escaping the room. Let me give him a hand for that. Church, it's a little rainy outside today, but how many of you think the rain is a little peaceful sounding? It's cool. That's, that's one thing I know uh, my wife was sitting there and I just love the sound of the rain. And I said, Lord, please don't let people fall asleep during that rain during the sermon. Amen? <laughs> All right. Somebody probably thought, well, preach shorter and I won't fall asleep. But I forget <laughs> in the name of Jesus. <laughs> but good morning, cross community. Uh, you may have to add a little, just a touch of a little more fire to me with the rain. Uh, but it is great to be here today. And I know that you all have been so excited because uh, we have spent uh, probably, I don't know, three years or so in the book of Exodus today. So I don't want to take away from a good thing. And so if you'll turn in the book of Exodus today, uh, we're going to finish the Ten Commandments this morning, uh, Lord willing. Exodus chapter 20, we're going to be looking at verse 17. I am excited about sharing the Word. It's always a privilege to preach to you. I feel like we have a great church. I feel like we have a great spirit in the house. I feel like we have great church members. I feel like those are guests today who haven't joined or you're just visiting. I feel like the Lord has brought you here for a reason. And I just think that we ought to praise our King for how great He is. Can we give Him some praise this morning? Amen. Amen. Exodus chapter 20. If you're there, say I'm there. And if you're not, then I forgive you. If you're not, say hold on. And if you'll pray with me. Father, we love you. And we ask that your Holy Spirit will continue to move in our midst today. I cannot teach or preach without your help. And God, I pray right now for a fresh anointing and a fresh power of the Holy Spirit to sweep through our church. I pray that as it rains, that your Spirit will just pour out upon us, that your kingdom come and your will will be done right here on earth as it is in heaven, that the students and the kids in the back will be blessed, that you anoint those teachers. Lord, I pray that the, your anointing will fall even fall in the nursery as, uh, as, as the kids play back there and they realize how important church is. But Father, I pray for our attention spans, may they be strong and healthy, and may you protect our church and everyone as they travel today. We can do nothing apart from you. So we give it to you today. Ask you to forgive us for our sins. And everybody said, Amen. 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 So today I want to share something with you um, about the Ten Commandments. We enter into the last one. Um, everybody say ten. ten. Ten is an interesting commandment. Um, it happens in the mind. Uh, I know I just asked you to say something. Everybody say, it's up here. And so uh, a lot of things in life, they happen up here before the action comes. This is going to be a challenging commandment because uh, this thought process is going to either lead us toward God or lead us away from God. And so it says this, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, all right? You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox. Now, nobody probably has to deal with that this morning, right? It says, or his donkey. You probably don't have to worry about that. Or anything that is your neighbor's. And you, know, you ever really think you kind of made it safely through something and then somebody adds something at the end like, like God did in this scripture and he said, or anything that, that, that's your neighbor. And so I, I, I just kind of want to point out some things here. To covet means to desire. Everybody say desire. So if I covet something, I want something that isn't mine. Right? Like, I, I wish I could have it. In other words... Uh, oh, uh, someone else's wife, someone else's kid, someone else's house, someone else's car. Uh, maybe for some of you it's their PlayStation. I don't know. It's a gun they have. It's the pretty grass in their yard. It's the location of maybe uh, where they live. Or, or maybe if it's someone they, they, they wish they could sing like someone else. They, they, they covet them. And this type of coveting, this type of desire, is not just a normal like, oh, I wish I could sing. Because how I many of you this morning, I wish I could sing. I would sing. Boy, I'd sing if I could. It'd be great. It's not just saying, you know what, he has a nice truck, or she has a nice truck, or they have a nice car. Well, I sure like to have a nice car too. No, it's something deeper. If I say deeper, it is a desire that goes way, way beyond 
the, the natural inclination, inclination to want something better. There's nothing wrong with wanting something better out of life as long as it's in the will of God. Amen? But it could be the money they have or the fame they have or the boat that they, the, that they have. It could be they're side by side. You know, you bought one and you wish you'd, uh, you'd have bought theirs and now you just covet theirs. It could be the camper. Uh, we were driving back from, from Florida, or I think I was on, on the way to Florida, on the way back, I might have been both. And my wife comes up with this camper thing. Like, hey, what about a camper? And I'm thinking, she's got to be joking, right? And so, we still haven't bought a camper. But anyway, I think she was joking. But how about this? I, I, this is honest. We can be honest right here. I'm going to get close to my honey about this. You're, not even, you're probably not even going to use my phone, but... We like big TVs. <laughs> okay? And so, I'm not going to say that we've slipped into the sin of coveting. Okay? I, I don't know. We might be on the edge. But when I go to somebody's house and they have a bigger TV, there's a little something in me that says, wait till Black Friday. <laughs> oh, you got a 79.5 inch TV? I'm going to beat you. If it's 79.6, like, we're going to, you know. Like, now, now, coveting would cause you to go steal and take it. Like, we don't steal people's TVs, right? But sometimes you just want stuff. And, and, and it, may be, it may not be a, something that you, you can purchase. Uh, how many of you covet sometimes uh, people that come off so confident and, and they don't ever really seem to be phased by things? And sometimes... We look at people that are so spiritual and on Sundays and the times you run into them and when they're teaching and leading Bible studies, I'll let you in on a little secret. The people that teach and lead Bible studies and the people that preach and the people that sing, they deal with the same stuff you do. But sometimes we see them and we say, oh, I'm just so jealous. I wish I could have that attitude. I wish I could have that. And sometimes we slip over into a sin called coveting. Now, now, I want to show you what John Piper says about this. And the reason why I like to quote a couple of people, John Piper and John MacArthur, I don't agree with everything they always say. But one of the things, this would be kind of like a little side note, a little side sermon. This is why I wouldn't promise a short sermon today. But sort of a side note, why I quote people like this is because they like to stick to what the Bible says. In other words, they will go to the Bible and instead of, instead of looking for something they want to hear, they let the Bible tell us what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And in today's world, what we have seen, and I've looked, and I've looked at organizations, and I've studied, and I've been around various organizations, and I've listened to various pastors and preachers and teachers, and some of them, I'm telling you, they can preach the house down. But their center of theology has sort of shifted into just preaching about things that make us feel good or that make us happy or, or, or it's what we want to hear about. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with helping people live their lives in a godly manner. But let me tell you something, church. Christianity is about God. I don't know if you knew that or not. And living for the Lord is about living for the Lord. It's not about all He can give me. He has already paid it all and now all to Him I owe. And so I quote this man because he, he, he points us. He, John Piper always points us back to bringing praise and glory to God. And so this is what he says about what it means to covet. He says, covet means desiring something too much. That's T-O-O. I don't know if you in English and you got that or not. But there's like the number two, and then there's T-O, and then there's T-O-O. -O. It's like too much. You add an extra O when it's too much. And he says, when you desire something too much, and it says, and too much is measured, this is how we measure about how if we know we're slipping in, into this sin of what it means to covet, to desire too much. It says it's measured by how that desiring compares to desiring God. In fact, his website is desiring God. It says, if desiring leads you away from God, Rather than closer to God, it is covetousness. It is sin. And y'all all still with me this morning. You're like, wow. Thank you, Pastor. And so it is an unhealthy craving. It's unhealthy. In other words, coveting can lead to 
us sinning. If you were to take uh, the verses and look at them again, you know, if you were to cover your neighbor's wife, it isn't just acknowledging that, that your neighbor has a good wife. Now, I'm going to make a suggestion. Don't acknowledge that to your wife. <laughs> All right? Wives, I'm going to make a suggestion. Let's be careful about bragging on somebody else's husband. Right? It is the kind of desire that will lead you to not caring about what other people think. And it, it, it causes you to reach for things that are not yours. In other words, if this coveting starts in your mind, this desire starts in your mind, and it can lead to an action. And what's crazy about the commandment number 10, about how we shouldn't covet, is that if you covet, it can lead to breaking other commandments. For example, if you covet and you commit adultery, you break the seventh commandment. If you covet and you want your neighbor's ox or you want his donkey and you steal it and you take it, then you broke the eighth commandment, which is do not steal. And so, and, and we'll learn a little bit more about what else coveting means. But the, the last commandment is similar to the first, and we'll explain that in just a moment, but the last commandment kind of wraps it up. And if you break the last one, you're probably breaking some of the other ones. And so coveting is not to be overlooked, and it is something to be focused on. It leads us away from God. It starts in the mind, as I've said, and it doesn't start as an action, but it starts up here, and then it moves on. And so true or false, and this is something that you know, maybe if I had the church phone up here. I'm going to do that one, son. I'm going to the church phone up and I'm going to let you maybe ask some questions or something. And all the jokesters are probably send me something funny. But anyway. If I were to ask you this morning, not by a verbal response, but let's just do by a show of hands and your opinion, okay? True or false, if you think it's true, if you think it's coveting is idolatry, would you slip your hand up? Alright, I would say a little approximately half-ish. Okay, go put your hand up. And just for the fun of it, for those of you who don't think that coveting is idolatry, could you slip your hand up? Alright, you are not brave people there. Okay. Some of you are really pumped up about this. I had to really study this, and, and I really had to become a believer, because sometimes verses will teach you what they mean. So if you answer true today, good for you, happy Sunday, you win. Alright? But covetousness is idolatry, which the first commandment, we're not supposed to have any idols, right? And, and the verse is going to prove it, because you might be saying, no, it's not. I don't see the word idol in that. Well, I'm going to show you in the New Testament what it says so that you can make sure that I'm right about this. How about that? All right. So Colossians 3, 5, the English Standard Version, says this. It says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And then he gives some examples. I mean, y'all are like, yeah, here we go. Especially the example I'm about to give, right? He says, sexual immorality. So that's any sexual act outside of the marriage covenant between man and woman. Anything outside of that is not God's will for your life, no matter how great it sounds or how fun it is. It's outside of His design. And some of you have experienced that. God forgives us for that. Let's move on from that. But let's not keep doing it. Let's move on from it. Amen? Okay. And so it says this. It says, put it to death in purity and passion and evil desire. And then it says, covetousness. And then it describes what it is. Which is what? Idolatry. And so, I look at that and say, man. Sometimes you ever wonder why God just tells us the same thing over and over and over? I mean... Have you ever been in a conversation with somebody and they've already told you the news and they told you the news again and they tell you, well, they just tell you something over and over and over and over until you finally respond like, my gosh, I heard you the first seven times. I know it's never happened in the <laughs> Right? Like, like I know the grass needs to be mowed. And so we see that it's idolatry. He said, man, is it really that big of a deal? Well, I think that if God takes a man up a mountain and he hand writes ten things into stone, tablets, and he sends that man back down the mountain and he tells them to tell the people what's on the tablets. This is Mama Moses here, okay? If he tells them to do that, then it's important. And, uh, you know, I'm not poking at him, it's just 
he goes up and he comes down in his glory. Like, like, if God writes something down, it's kind of a big deal. We look at it like 10 things that'd be nice if everybody did them, right? 10 things that'd be nice if we followed them. No, 10 things that are vital to the faith. The Ten Commandments. And so, coveting is idolatry. Well, what is idolatry? Well, I'll say this. The Bible teaches us that we should have no idols before the Lord, right? Like, anything that we... Some of you have some people that you idolize, all right? We kind of use the term loosely, maybe. I wish I could play the guitar like him. I wish I could sing like her. And I idolize them. I wish I could preach like so-and-so. I wish I could teach like so-and-so. This is much deeper. Having an idol is something that you want more and you spend more time focusing on it than you do God. And I think here, here is not just in our church, but I just mean in general, we have really decided that everything we want in life is really what ought to happen. We've decided that it's it, we idolize our own personal dreams. We idolize what we want to get out of God. In other words, I think sometimes we try to use God as a pawn to get us what we want. And, and sometimes, y'all, I'm going to tell you, it's not going to work out good in the end when you try to use God to get something. It's God using us to fulfill His will. And that's different theology than what I'm hearing from many mainstream people. And that's why we're here. And so anything that you put before the Lord, it can be a person, place, thing, or idea. Thank you, English teacher. That is a noun. <laughs> a person, place, thing, or idea. Anything that will cause you to lose focus on God and you will do anything to achieve it can become an idol. It can cause you to cut it, which can lead to sin. And I'm thankful this morning that we have a God who forgives us and who sets us free and empowers us to overcome coveting. Amen to that? How many of you are thankful this morning that I don't have you don't have to leave upset about this. You can leave forgiven and stepping out in faith and leaving uh, uh, our tendency to cut it behind. You can overcome it. You can beat it. That's the beauty of the gospel. Jesus paid for our sins. His Holy Spirit lives within us and we have the power to overcome sin. Good stuff. And so, what is one of the major idols in our lives? What are we most hesitant about giving to God? What is one thing we so often trust more than we do God? What is one thing we often seek more than God? Now, some of you probably had different answers if you were writing this down or writing it down in your mind. Some of you might be afraid to actually write that in your notes because your little nosy neighbor might watch and see little nosy neighbor. Stay out of my nosy sins. But here's one thing. And I'll show you this today. Money. Money. Some of y'all might have turned me off right there. I'm not, I'm not going to let you turn. I'm not going to let you. I'm not going to let it happen today. By faith. I'm going to tell you something. There is nothing money can do better for you than what God can do. There is nothing that will... It's, look, it's so weird because what's on the money in God we trust is truly not the... We, most of the time, we don't really trust God. We trust the money more than we do God. If we start trusting God more than we do the money, we'll see Him providing whatever we might need. But we covet other people's... How many people will steal? Listen, coveting leads to crimes. Why do you think people steal money? Sometimes they might have some basic needs. Most of the time that's probably not the case. We covet what other people have. We desire it. We want it. And money is one of those things, y'all. We will cheat. We will lie. We will steal. People will sleep there. They will break all kinds of commands. They will sleep their way to the top to get money. And I'm telling you, church, money is not evil in itself. In fact, this is what the Bible says. It says for the love. Everybody say love. The love of money. It's not, it's not the money itself, but the love of it is the root of all kinds of evils. 
It's so crazy to me that we live in such a blessed world, but yet we feel like we don't have enough. You don't have to raise your hand this morning, but how many of you this morning wish you could have more? Right? Don't raise your hand this morning, but how many of you used to be poorer than you are now? I mean, like, don't raise your hand, you raise your hand. Don't worry, like, bad falling red. <laughs> don't worry, I, I can be just that way too. I'm teaching. Some of us, we have more than we've ever had. You thought when you got a family, you'd be satisfied. You thought when you got a promotion, you'd be satisfied. You thought when you got whatever it may be, that you and, and, and there's always something more that you want. You're always coveting and desiring something else. And you'll do whatever it takes to get it. And then when you get it, you're not as happy as you thought. When you when, Listen, when, when you finally get the new vehicle, they come out with a new one. I'm preaching to myself now. <laughs> When you finally buy a nice, uh, a nice truck and finance it for the rest of your life, I so said, "How long can we? I got to get that payment over. How long can you finance it?" And then before you have it paid off, they come out with a new body style. Come on, shake my head. That's in my head, right? We cut it, we want it, we got to have it. We'll do anything. And for so many of us, we, listen, I understand, I am not naive to the fact that it takes money to buy food, right? That it takes money to pay rent or a mortgage or all these things. Like, we have to be people who work or have a way of bringing in some type of income if we are capable of doing that. Can we agree with that? But when we covet money so badly that we'll do anything it takes to get it, that you'll do little sly things, that you'll change the numbers here and there, that you'll smile a little extra, or, or you'll, you'll, you'll take from the company because it's the company. And, and I can tell you from experience, just because something is a company doesn't mean that they have the extras just to give it to you. Can any business people in the room say amen to me? And we will do whatever it takes. Yeah. People get uncomfortable when you talk about money. I hope you're not that uncomfortable. If you're uncomfortable, it's probably because we don't have those padded chairs yet. But they're coming. Somebody say amen. amen. They're looking at them. It'll be great. But one of the things we covet is money, and that's why the Bible talks about it. Here's what it says about us when we desire it, when we've got to have it. And we, we think that it is going to be our source of happiness. I've seen people that were close to the Lord and then when God provides for them, they slip away. It says this, It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith. In other words, this love of money has driven them to do things that has pulled them. If they, they have wandered away from God because they want money so badly. I don't want to be that person. Anybody in the church? And we got all these things like, oh, you can't take it with you. Blah, 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 blah. Look at our lives and let's see. Are we chasing the dollars more than we are Jesus? And if we're chasing the dollars more than we are Jesus, we've got a priority issue. We have an idol issue. We, have, we, we might be slipping into a sin of covenant. And so today I want us to be free from that. But notice what it says. They have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. In other words, they thought it was going to be great. They wandered from the faith and in the end, it didn't fulfill them. Can anybody testify this morning that no matter how much money is in the bank, it cannot provide for you what God can provide for you? A whole lot of people have made it. And listen, we don't need to be upset with people that have money. It's okay to have money. It's okay to be poor. It's okay to be middle class. It's not okay not to follow Jesus. So, wherever you are this morning, poor, middle class, wealthy, we love you. You're all welcome here. We're all one family. Let's just never make that the focus of our lives. Amen. And so how do I stop coveting? How do I stop it? Right? Anybody, go raise your hand. We got, some, we got some habits in the room, don't we? How do I stop? 
Even the Apostle Paul says this over the book of Romans. And I'm kind of paraphrasing, but Paul was like, listen, everything that I want to do, I don't. Everything I don't want to do, I do. And you just feel like Homer says, you just don't. <laughs> Not advocating that that's a Christian show. I just, I've seen that before. Anyway. And so we confess it to the Lord. So if something is in you today, you're like, yeah, that's true. I want this. I, this is my focus. It's not God. This is my focus. It's not God. This is what this is. There, there's something in me that, man, I'm, I'm about to do something wrong, and I know it, and I've justified it in my mind. I want to relieve you of that form of justification. If it goes against the Bible, then it's wrong. Come on, somebody. And so we confess it to the Lord. We say, Lord, I am not perfect. And I feel myself slipping into this sin. I'm wandering away from the faith. And we say, Lord, we need strength. We need help. We need some, we, we, I need some focus, Lord. I need some help. And we confess it before the Lord. The next thing we do is we have to remember that God is our ultimate treasure. I don't know if you ever think about it this way. The truth be told, y'all, if you have nothing but you have God, you have a lot. Next week, we'll talk about, more than likely, as the Lord leads me in the direction, we'll talk about the Apostle Paul while he was in jail and some of the things he said while he was in jail about how he had everything and he's, he knows what it's like to have a lot and knows what it's like to have a little. The church, God is our ultimate treasure. I love this church. But darn near all of my heart, I love this church. Anybody else love this church? I love this church. I love it. But God is my treasure. Y'all, we haven't taught a generation of Christians that God is the reward. We've taught that God's promises are the reward. But ladies and gentlemen, His promises are true and His promises are right and I reach for them and I pray for them and I walk in faith and I believe for them. But God is my reward. And it's hard to accept that and learn that when we've been taught that God is nothing but a genie and if you pray the right way and you do this the right way and you act the right way and you, you live this kind of way, then you can get what you want from it. That's the prosperity gospel, and we've got to put an end to it. Does God want to prosper us? I believe that He does. But what does that look like in true Christian theology? I hear some mega pastor is looking to raise money for another jet. I think he's already got three or four. I don't know. How many of that? That's not the good thing. That's not good theology. Stop sending them money if you are. Let's give you a word. You don't even have to worry about it. Stop sending him money for planes. One's enough. <laughs> Somebody said we need to get a helicopter or something. I don't know about that. Don't they crash more than white anyway? <laughs> Nothing wrong with having stuff. Nothing wrong with ministry having a plane. Don't hear me wrong. But y'all know exactly what I mean. The love of money. It's, it's the root. It's the problem. God is our treasure. How do I stop coming? I spend time with God. Oh my goodness. I almost want to tell you to turn off the recording so I can say what I really want to say. Somebody calls me. I call them. I get a message, whatever, email, whatever, text. I just don't know what to do, Brother Adam. You know what combination comes from, right? Pastor Adam, Reverend Adam, Adam. Nobody's really ever called me Bishop in a minute, but they do. They do feel too, whatever. What's bishop? I feel like a bishop should be taller than me, but anyway, whatever I am. I just don't know what to do. Well, let's go back to the basics, sir, ma'am. Spending any time with the Lord? Well, you know. Well, brother Adam. I, I, I prayed about it. And what that means is I prayed before I called you, right? <laughs> right? 
right? Nothing wrong with that. We need counseling. We need help. We need people to take care of us. We need a family of believers. We need a small group we can be a part of. We need people to tell our problems. We need, we need that. I need that. You need that. We all need that in our lives. But, but so many times, people are doing whatever they want to do with their lives, and then all of a sudden they run and they say, well, why is it this way? Why didn't this work out? And I just want to say, son, you're not following God. And he's not that hard to follow. And so, are you spending any time with God? Well, you know, my work schedule. Did you know they had Saturday night services at other churches? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, my work schedule. So you didn't have any time to read your Bible pray. You didn't have any time. Like, yeah, my work schedule. How many know that whether you work on Sunday or you don't work on Sunday, that does not keep you from spending time with the Lord? And we've raised a generation to be so stuck on church, and, 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 and we, we think that the only way we can hear from God is if we come here. I'm going to tell you, if you will get before the Lord and read your Bible and read some devotionals and you'll take a few moments to, to, to pray, you'll start seeing God talk. You'll start hearing His voice speak to you in your heart. You, you start spending time with the Lord and you put the Lord first, all of a sudden some of that covenant, you'll realize it is better to be in the presence of God than it is better to be in the presence of anything. We have a sin and it's idolatry and coveting. Spend time with the Lord. And also this, number four, spend time with people whose ultimate treasure is God. Some of you in the room today know some people who are uh, very godly people. Anybody know some godly folks? Right? I don't mean they're perfect. Hang around them long enough, you'll find they're not. But for some of us, we've got to surround ourselves with more godly people. This morning I'll ask that the worship team to come. This is sort of a part one of a part two message. Now how many this morning would just say, I want to desire God more than I desire anything else? Right? Just stand with me today.